Hey, good morning, one and all. Welcome today to uh, Worship in the Summer. We're glad you're with us this morning. Uh, bless you today. Thank you for coming. If you're our guest and have not been with us before, find a little slip tucked into a chair near you, and you can fill that out and make that your offering out in the foyer in that little box out there. Drop it in there. Uh, we're glad you're here today. Uh, please also, might we just say as we get started, uh, keep the Powell family in your prayers. Uh, Dr. Powell uh, went home to be with the Lord a couple of days ago, and uh, pray for the family as they are having to say goodbye now uh, for a while. Goodbye for now, but not forever. Uh, we, uh, we have put our hope in the promise of God and Jesus Christ, and that makes all the difference in this world and the next. So do pray for them, though, please. Also, continue to lift up uh, Lori Drews in your prayers as well. We'll pray for each of these in a little bit here, but uh, she's been in the hospital over the weekend and just gotten back home awaiting a liver transplant, so pretty seriously ill. So please pray for her. Pray for David as he cares for her day by day as well. All right, let's stand together and have a word of prayer, and then we'll do some singing, all right? Pray with me. Father, thank you that you are with us. Thank you that you are the one who comes alongside us, both to give us comfort and encouragement and peace, and sometimes to uh, give us a good uh, kick in the rear when we need it to keep moving in the right direction. We thank you that you're present with us by your Spirit to fulfill the promise of Jesus, that where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the, in the midst. We recognize you, Lord Jesus, in the center of our gathering today. Help us to worship from the heart this morning. In Jesus' name we pray.
love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love. And on and on and on and on it goes. Yes, it overwhelms and satisfies my soul. Please have a seat, and we'll have a scripture reading at this time. are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after may, may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy a long life. Hear me, O Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in the lands flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord your, your fathers promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. These are the commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts, impress them on your children, talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up, tie them as symbols to your hands, bind them to your foreheads, write them on your door frames of your houses and on the gates. When the Lord your God brings into you the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give to you a land with large flourishing cities that you did not build, houses with all kinds of things that you did not provide, wells you did not dig, vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. 
then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you, that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Fear the Lord your God. Serve him only to take your oaths on his name. Do not allow other gods, the gods of people around you, or do not follow other gods, the gods of people around you. For your God is among you, uh, who is, who is a, among you is a jealous God and his anger will burn against you and he will destroy you from the face of this land. So, um, go ahead and pray this morning. Um, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I'd just like to um, lift up the, the Powell family, Father, as, as Dr. Powell has went to see you um, the other day. Just um, be with the whole family, Jan, and the plans for the services, Father. Um, just let them know that um, you are with them, and he was a very special person that touched our hearts, Father. I just, um, I also ask you to be with uh, David and Lori Drews this morning. Uh, Lori is in the hospital. Um, um, that uh, that uh, they will get the everything worked out. That she has a, a meeting with uh, um, July 8th with the doctors about uh, her liver transplant, Father. That. Um, that will happen soon, Father, that just, um, but do let them know that you are with them and you are in charge, Father. Also ask you to be with, um, continue to be with Terry and Pam Conover and their health situations, Father. Um, and uh, also this week, uh, be with the Woody family who has lost their nephew, cousin, uh, Sean Allen, uh, this last week to a massive heart attack, Father. Just, I bring these prayers to you and just know that you are in all of these situations, Father. Um, I just ask you to give us all a good day this, this morning and uh, be with the pastor as he presents his message to us. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brett. Please stand and we'll continue worshiping in song. Change. 
With every breath I long to follow Jesus For He has said that He will bring me home And day by day I know He will renew me Until I stand with joy before the throne To this I hope, my hope is only Jesus All the glory evermore to Him When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat Yet not I, but through Christ in Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me.
thank you, Father, um, for giving us this hope, for giving us this hope that is in your Son, Jesus, for giving us hope for life after this life, as well as power and hope and confidence to go on living, trusting you in this life. And we pray now, Father, that you will teach us from your word and that you will touch our hearts and change our lives as you see fit. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please have a seat. Amen. And while you're settling in, uh, find a Bible nearby or um, open your device that has a Bible app and turn to Genesis chapter 12. I've had a conviction on my heart that uh, we needed to do a little bit of focus on the, um, one of the big issues in our time, how, and especially from a Christian point of view, how should Christians view the situation in Israel at the present time? And we're going to focus on that a little bit today, and Lord willing, uh, for a couple of weeks. So um, pray for me as we do. This is, uh, I think, important and timely, but um, I hope will be valuable for us. Before we get started on that too far, though, I want to have a little word with our children. So, um, kids, come on down. Let's have a little visit together, shall we? Come on up. Come on up. Come and have a seat. Hello over there. Hello over there. All right. Well, I want to talk about um, the love of God. All right? So, let's begin by, by this simple observation. Some of you are on my right side and some of you are on my left side. And we all know that, you know, God loves the people on my left side but not the ones on my right. Is that right? No. No? He loves people on both sides? Yeah. Oh, gosh. Okay, I know. Everybody, everybody stand up for a minute. Okay. So let's see. Some of you are short and some of you are taller. So obviously God only loves people who are tall, right? No. No? No. <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> okay. So that's not true either. All right. So God loves people of all sizes. <laughs> Uh, no. <laughs> Which one of you said that in such a low voice? <laughs> that came from up there. Okay, um, well, let's see. We have boys and girls. Never forget that. We have boys and girls. Well, <clears throat> obviously, God loves boys. <clears throat> no. No. <laughs> and, and girls. And girls, yes, yes, okay, well, that's, okay, that's important to remember. Okay, so let's think about this for a second. Some of you have longer hair and some have shorter hair. Well, obviously, God only loves people with shorter hair. No! He loves people with all lengths of hair, too, huh, right? You should have in-between hair. I don't know where that puts you on that question. Well, you know, the fact is, God loves everybody, and he wants everyone to know him and trust him. So, hang on there, hang on, hang on. It's just going to be a minute. Hang in there, just a second. Here's the, here's the verse we all want to remember, right? Okay, listen real closely, and I hope you'll commit this to memory and think about it a lot throughout your whole life. Here's how it goes. For God so loved the world. That's everybody in it, right? that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. There it is. God loves everyone everywhere. And I want you to remember that because sometimes people will say, well, God only likes people like me. And they will hate other people just because they're different. Well, that's not God's way, is it? He loves everyone and wants them to come to put their trust in Jesus and have their lives so transformed that they will live forever with Him. That's His plan, and that's how much He loves us. Let's pray together. 
Hey, nice glasses, by the way. I got some of those. Yeah. Let's pray. Thank you for your love for us, dear Lord, and thank you that you remind us that whether we're tall or short or whatever length our hair might be or whether we're boys or girls or whether we live here or whether we live somewhere on the other end of the earth, that you love us and you sent your Son, our Lord Jesus, to show your love to us and ultimately to save us as we put our trust in Jesus to forgive our sins and to give us eternal life. Thank you for that. Help us to get the message out of this great truth and of your great love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I think I probably have a little something for you in here. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find some broccoli-shaped candy one of these days, and that'll be really fun. But Okay, here you go. Have one of these. These are yummy. Shoop. Skipped you, didn't I? You weren't looking. Here you go. I don't know what color these are, but they're going to be great, whatever they are, right? They're various colors. Have one of these. There you go. Thanks for coming down this morning. You guys can go join your families. There you go. They all taste like candy, so I'm sure they'll be yummy. Here you go. Take one of those. Have one of these. If I run out, I'll be down to the broccoli. Okay. Ooh, nice catch. Wow. Very good. Yes. Here, here. There you go. There you go. Hello. Good morning, little buddy. Yeah, you know. Yeah, you better have one too. <laughs> this one for all the kids. Here, here's here's one too for the short person up there that uh, <clears throat> needs one too. <laughs> all right. All right. Thank you. What an opportunity we have to uh, have an influence on the next generation. I hope you're praying for Vacation Bible School, by the way, too. We just had our first little workers' meeting yesterday. There's still time for you to get on board, so talk with Stacia or Lydia or somebody. I think those two are coordinating this thing. So uh, talk to one of them and get involved if you can, all right? You have Genesis chapter 12, and we're going to dive in here in just a minute. But uh, you know that since uh, October the 7th of 2023, Israel has been the center of the news. On that date, Hamas soldiers, along with Gazan radicals, attacked Israel, killing more than 1,200 people, taking nearly 250 hostages of 20 nationalities and five different religions. The attacks were particularly brutal, raping, mutilating, burning people alive, including infants and elderly people, as the terrorists went from house to house, jacked up on a strong amphetamine, apparently. They were indiscriminate. They killed Jews mostly, but also Arab citizens of Israel and Americans who are visiting Israel. And since then, the Israeli Defense Force, the IDF, has struck back against Hamas's network of tunnels and strongholds, often built under schools and hospitals, because they know that the IDF has careful rules of engagement that attempt to minimize civilian casualties. This forms one of the stark contrasts in the war. Hamas hides behind civilians, knowing that when they are killed, their propaganda machine hums. Israel requires strict adherence to rules of engagement by the IDF, seeking to avoid civilian casualties whenever possible. Hamas and its Western sympathizers bill this as a war over land. Well, it is that, but it's really a war over ideas, worldview. Hamas has not only waged violent war against Israel, but it also has waged a surprisingly successful war of propaganda against not only Israel, but the West in general, particularly America. They have funded and incited mobs on university campuses and in large cities across America and other parts of the West. They have portrayed Israel and America as the colonial aggressors to justify their slaughter. They have aroused anti-Semitism to a whole new level in this generation. Jewish university students are fearing for their lives again. So what are Christians to think about all of this? Are the slogans right? 
Is Israel truly the colonial aggressor against the oppressed Gazans who are trying to be free? Or is there something different and more, well, diabolical at work? In his recent book, Should Christians Support Israel?, Dr. Jeff Myers, the president of Summit Ministries, quotes Voltaire, 18th century French writer, quote, surely anyone who can get people to believe absurdities can get them to commit atrocities. This seems to describe well the organization called Hamas and their minions around the world who spout their slogans. Let's take a closer look at this question. How should Christians respond to the war against Israel and the resurgence of anti-Semitism? To answer the question, we must back up, not to the early 20th century when the Ottoman Empire collapsed, but to 4,000 years ago. Around that time, the creator of everything else outside of himself called a man into a covenant, and that man's name was Abram, later changed to Abraham. And here's the story of that calling. The issue does have to do with land, but it also has to do with big ideas about life and the place of the living God in those big ideas. So let's take a closer look, beginning at Genesis 12. And if you're able, stand with me as I read a few of those verses out loud. Genesis 12, beginning at verse 1. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moreh at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, "'To your offspring I will give this land.'" So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. And from there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Thank you. Please be seated. The covenant with Abram, notice, included the promised land. Any Bible reader has seen that very clearly. Abraham was called by God, note the very first sentence in this story, to leave his place of residence and his clan and family and to go to a land that God would show him. Though we are now under a new covenant with God through faith in Jesus Christ, we have just talked about that rather extensively in the book of Hebrews. This promise for the land to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or Israel, seems not to have been revoked. Any other claims to the land of Israel are of recent origin and do not have the promise of God attached to them. The slogan, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, is pure propaganda by pro-Hamas PR specialists. Many young adults in the United States who have joined in that chant cannot name either the river or the sea to which it refers. Plus, there never has been a Palestine to be free. This is an interesting little thing to remember. When the nation-states of Israel and its surrounding nations were formed, all of them in the 1940s, Israel in 1948, Lebanon in 1943, Jordan in 1946, Syria in 1944, and Egypt in 1947. None of them date back before 1940. The United Nations offered to the Arabs, whose descendants are now inhabiting Gaza and the West Bank, to form a nation. They refused. Remember that the defining purpose of Hamas is to destroy Israel and to kill Israelis. They are anti-Semitic by definition. This is not mysterious. 
They've said these things over and over. They hold the people of Gaza under their rule of terror, just as they use terrorist tactics to kill and demoralize Israelis. So the claim to the land by Israel, the only Jewish nation, nation state in the entire world, is ancient and was established by God. So notice that the covenant with Abraham included a chosen nation. God promised Abraham that he would make him into a great nation and give him a great name. Well, this surely came to pass during the reigns of David and Solomon, sort of the peak, you know, of Israel's history before the civil war that fractured Israel and Judah during the reign of Rehoboam, Solomon's son and heir to the throne. This chosen nation became Israel during the time of Joshua and Judges and the Kings and Chronicles. Their story is told at length there. There's a very long history involved here that the Bible describes in detail. The first five books of the Bible, often called the Pentateuch, the five books, tell the story of how the world and then that nation came into existence. The books, again, of Joshua, Judges, the Kings, the Chronicles, give the arc of Israel's history until the nation went into captivity and the people were scattered about the world because of their lapse into idolatry and evil behavior. And Ezra and Nehemiah tell the story of how the people of Israel were brought back to the promised land by the mercy and power of God, working, interestingly enough, through a pagan ruler named Cyrus, who was the king of Persia. Notice that the covenant with Abraham included a global blessing. God promised Abraham that he would be a blessing to all the families of the earth. Don't forget that he said, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. But this blessing was to go to all the families of the earth. How could this be fulfilled? Well, this promise is ultimately fulfilled through the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ, through whom, by faith, anyone, anywhere, can become a child of God and a part of God's new covenant family. Now, will this promise be fulfilled? Will all the families of the earth be blessed through this heritage? Revelation 7, verses 9 and 10, describe a vision of the fulfillment of that promise that was ultimately made to Abraham. This promise is fulfilled as, in the vision that he has there, every people from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, come to worship God through faith in Jesus Christ. And that vision follows a prior vision of 144,000, 12,000 from each of the tribes of Israel who were sealed as servants of God. Some take this literally. I think it's more of a symbolic number. Either way, God's saving purpose for Israel and for all the people groups of the world is truly going to be fulfilled. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you because Jesus is directly on the, in the human level descended from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and beyond. Well, God's saving purpose in the gospel is, as the Apostle Paul puts it in Romans 1.16, the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, and listen carefully, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The Greek <laughs> represents everyone else who is not from the region of Judea. Like us, for example, we are entering into the blessing given to Abraham through our faith in Jesus Christ, though we are not directly descended biologically from Him. Notice that in this calling from God, it simply says, verse 4, so Abram went as the Lord told him. He obeyed the calling and set out for the promised land. He packed up everything he owned. He collected all the people associated with his family, including his nephew Lot, who kind of plays into the story as the book of Genesis unfolds, and set out not knowing really where he was going to go until he got there. And he arrived in Canaan, and the Lord said, this is the land, the promised land. Now, you'll notice this, that 
Abraham's response to the call of God required faith. Being in a right relationship with God always requires faith. It doesn't have to do with being born in the right place or to the right parents. It has to do with being in a right relationship with Him by faith in His Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice again Romans chapter 1. In Romans where Paul maps out the history and the logic of salvation very carefully, he says, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Romans 1.17. Abraham's faith led him to fulfill the calling of God. When called by God, he packed up everything he owned, he moved to the promised land. And this causes me to just pause and ask, what will faith cause us to do? At the very least, it will lead us to cast our hope on the final work of Jesus Christ on the cross. It will lead us to put Him first in our hearts, to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, Matthew 6.33. It will lead us to be honest in business and in school. It will lead us to bear witness to God's grace in our lives. It will lead us to submit to the Holy Spirit of God who is tirelessly working to form godly character in our personalities. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, self-control, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. True faith does not leave us the same as we were prior to faith. That's why Abraham is such an example of faith. He believed God, and then he set out to fulfill the calling of God in his life. He was never the same again. He had his moments. <laughs> Keep reading. His story's not glossed over. He was a man with plenty of, you know, frailties. But he kept trusting God. And notice that God confirmed his promise to Abraham for the land that would become Israel. When he arrived there, verse 7, to your offspring I will give this land. This is our next major point, but note that God did not leave Abraham to wonder if he was on the right path. He confirmed his calling and the covenant in a timely manner. The Palestinian claim to the land of Israel only dates back to the end of the 19th century. The claim of Israel to their own land dates to the covenant with Abraham 4,000 years ago. Take this into account in your conversations with people who seem to accuse Israel of some kind of colonial aggression. Notice, secondly, and turn the page or two down the way to Genesis chapter 15. I think we need to read a little bit there as well. God fulfilled His promise to Abraham in His perfect timing. And in fact, you, if you miss this point, you misinterpret a lot of the, the narrative of the Old Testament. So listen closely. Genesis 15. Lots of things happened, <laughs> all this stuff with Lot and Sodom, not the whole story yet. But after this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abraham, or Abram still. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless, and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, you've given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, this man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Here's a cru here the crux of the story. Abram believed the Lord, and it, he credited it to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. 
And as the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. And then the Lord said to him, here it is, know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there, but I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, and here, here's a sentence you must not forget, for the sin of the Amorite has not yet reached its full measure. This whole thing with the animals cut in half and whatever sort of is, you know, and, and the make a covenant was often actually literally called cut a covenant. The idea was that if I don't keep my word, may I be like these animals that have been cut in half and whose carcasses have been laid out on the ground. It's kind of a, you know, dramatic <clears throat> way to make the point, but notice that our first thought from this is God's timing was perfect for the fulfillment of His promise to Abraham. His descendants would indeed inherit the land, but God promised that 400 years would pass, and so it did before the people came to possess the promised land. Fast forward, if you were, you look it up right quick, to Exodus chapter 12, verses 40 and 41. It says there that 430 years passed to the day before they went out of, of uh, Egypt toward the promised land. Now, note a second insight here. God is fulfilling a promise to Abraham, but He's also bringing judgment on the people in the land. God's timing was perfect for His judgment on the evil of the people in the land of Canaan. This is the importance of Genesis 15, 12 through 17, the other slope of the mountain, you might call it. God would not allow Israel to take the land until His words here, Genesis 15, 16, until the sin of the Amorite, the people who lived in Canaan, had reached full measure. Meaning that at that time, that Abraham's descendants would enter the land, the present inhabitants had passed the point of no return in their idolatry and wickedness. At just the right time, God's promise to Abraham and His judgment on the evil people in the land came together. And this is the point of the conquest of Canaan. Now, back up. Remember, the inheritance of the land of Israel given to Abraham's descendants, ultimately through Jacob slash Israel, was both the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham and judgment on the evil of the people who lived in the land. This was part of the message from Moses as the people stood at the entrance to the promised land. They were entering the land because of God's mercy, not their merit, and God was expelling the people who lived there because of their idolatry and evil. The reference here is Genesis 7, 7 through 10. This is slope one, the promise to Abraham's descendants. Listen to it. The Lord did not set His affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath He swore to your ancestors, Genesis 12 and 15, that He brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is a faithful God, keeping His covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love Him and keep His commandments. But those who hate Him, He will repay to their face by destruction. He will not be slow to repay to their face those who hate Him. Slope two is the judgment of God on the evil people of Canaan. And this He makes clear in Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 4. After the Lord your God has driven them out before you, do not say to yourself, the Lord has brought me here to take possession of this land because of my righteousness. No, it is on account of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is going to drive them out before you. It is not because of your righteousness or your integrity that you are going to take possession of the land, but on account of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord will, your God will drive them out before you to accomplish what He swore to your fathers to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. See how those two come together 
at the point where they possess the land. God fulfills His promise to Abraham. He brings judgment on the people in the land for their evil. And understand then, he says at the end of that little passage, that it's not because of your righteousness that the Lord your God has given you this good land to possess, for you are a stiff-necked people. You know, Moses kind of venting himself a little bit there, <clears throat> and he had learned that by experience. Well, this is a good moment to remind all of us that we are now saved by grace and not works or merit. Jesus has done the work to secure our salvation, much as God did the work to deliver the people of Israel from slavery and to fulfill His promise. We must trust in God's grace through faith, and then we act on that faith in the new life that God empowers by His Spirit. Right there in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, another passage we should all memorize and think about somewhat regularly, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one may boast. For you are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So there you have it. Grace, faith, works. I remind us again that if we change the order of these, we are no longer in a new covenant idea of salvation. We have, well, we have false teaching if it's arranged any other way, which leads right to our next observation. God's promise was and is conditional on the response of the people. In fact, there in Genesis, I mean rather in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 15, I should probably read this directly once again for you. And somewhere I have Deuteronomy in my Bible here, and this monster... Uh, <clears throat> monster large print edition that I keep up here. Genesis chapter 5, or rather 6, verse 15, says this, For the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God, and His anger will burn against you, and He will destroy you from the face of the land. That's if they turned away and fell into the very same things that the people who had been in the land before them had committed, idolatry, and evil. God called His covenant people, note this firstly, to be holy to Him. Deuteronomy 7 verse 6 makes that clear. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be His people, His treasured possession. They were not simply given a new land to do with it what they wished. They were given a trust from God to express what it meant to be the people of Yahweh, the living God, who created everything else outside of Himself that was not restricted to the borders of a land, but who was the creator of everything. If the people then became unfaithful to God, that's what He said in Deuteronomy 6.15, they would be in danger of ruin and expulsion from the land. Well, God's sense of justice is perfect even if his patience is long. You know, the conquest of Canaan illustrates this. God made the Israelites wait 430 years before the promise of God was fulfilled to Abraham's descendants. Why is this? Because he is long-suffering. He puts up with people for a long time before he finally says, you've hit the red line and I'm going to act in judgment. The time did finally come, and the evil people of the promised land were judged as the promise was fulfilled to Abraham and his descendants. Well, the history of Israel confirms this conditional promise. If you've read through the Bible lately, or maybe sometime in your life, you, you understand this ark. They finally entered the land. The book of Joshua describes this. After 40 years of wandering about in the wilderness, because of their lack of the obedience of faith. They shrank back and would not move forward. And in some sense, they had enough faith to leave Egyptian slavery, but not enough faith to go in to the promised land. Well, finally, they entered the promised land under the leadership of Joshua. They lived there for centuries, the period of the judges and the kings. This covers a very long span of history with many ups and downs. They were then expelled from the land for 70 years, 
due to persistent idolatry and the evil that attended that idolatry. This is explained, by the way, a couple of passages of Scripture you might note. 2 Chronicles 36, verses 15 through 21, and Jeremiah 25, verses 8 through 14, explain why they were being expelled from the land. Then, 70 years passed, they were brought back from captivity by God's mercy and grace. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah describe this during the time of Cyrus, king of Persia, and, and his followers. This is where the biblical witness concludes. The people of Israel have managed to remain in the land of promise up until a generation after Jesus Christ was crucified, risen, and ascended into heaven. They were driven from the land by the Roman armies in AD 70. Jesus made some comments about this. They resettled in the land in 1948, and they have defended themselves from full-scale war from their enemies on several occasions, 1948, 1967, 1973. They have suffered repeated terrorist attacks leading up to the most recent on 10-7 of 2023. Summing up, that's a whole lot of history. Now let's come in for a landing after that flyover of most of the Old Testament. God's salvation is not without spiritual and moral demands. We must put our trust in Him and allow Him to shape our lives under His leading. We will see this more as we delve into the New Testament perspective toward the people of Israel. Romans chapters 9 through 11, you can read those in advance and we'll focus on them for a while, Lord willing. The current constitution of Israel, by the way, is shaped by the ancient covenant God instituted through Moses. Our own constitutional republic has been strongly influenced by a similar kind of government based on biblical insight. Dr. Jeff Myers, once again, in the introduction introductory parts of his little book, traveled to Israel only 103 days after the terrorist attacks on 10-7 of 23. He took part in conversations with a variety of people in government, in the IDF, among the citizens who were both Arab and Israeli descent, and were survivors and relatives of hostages taken by Hamas into Gaza. In one conversation with an Israeli intelligence officer named Itamar bin David, he gained a new perspective toward Israel's government framework. Ben David told them that Israel was, quote, not as much a religious nation as a nation with a divine constitution. According to Ben David, the aspiration of this ancient divine constitution can be summarized in two words. And here's your Hebrew word lesson for Sunday. The first one is tzedakah. Tzedakah is a state of society in which justice reigns. And the second word is mishpat. Mishpat is what is needed to restore justice from injustice. This is why the IDF is not allowed to kill indiscriminately, as does Hamas. They are shaped by this biblical conviction of the sacred nature of human life. They seek to wage war only with those who are waging war against them. When Dr. Myers asked an Israeli citizen soldier how he knows the difference between terrorists and civilians, the soldier gave a straightforward answer. The terrorists are the ones that shoot at us. Well, it's rather amazing how restrained Israel has been, has been given the brutality against ordinary citizens in the attack by Hamas. By the publication of Dr. Meyer's book, which came out early this year, since October the 7th, the IDF has made 79,000 phone calls, sent 13.7 million text messages, dropped 7.2 million pamphlets, made 15 million recorded phone calls, and, evap and evacuated 1.2 million Gazans to safe zones. He quotes John Spencer, a leading expert on urban warfare, who says, quote, Israel has implemented more precautions to prevent civilian harm than any military in history, above and beyond what international law requires, and more than the United States did in its wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. 
In contrast, Hamas's own leaders have extolled the virtue of civilian deaths, which advance their propaganda agenda. Every dead civilian gives them yet another picture to post and accuse Israel of genocide. Have you heard that word in this conversation? Odd term when applied to Israel, it is Hamas whose stated charter makes it clear that they exist for one primary purpose, killing Jews and destroying Israel. They're not even liked by other Islamic nations around them. That's why nobody will let them come there. Seems to be the definition of genocide to be committed to killing a certain kind of person and destroying their nation. Well, which of these approaches to the current conflict seems more in keeping with the moral boundaries of God's covenant with humanity, even the old covenant? Seems pretty clear to me. Let's take this home this morning. Number one, Israel was given their land by God, and though the covenant with God has now changed, that gift does not seem to have been rescinded. Israel has an ancient claim on their land that originated by God. Two, we must learn from Israel's story that God's covenant with humanity is on His terms and not ours. God called the descendants of Abraham into a covenant with Himself. That covenant changed and became more focused under Moses, the Mosaic covenant. God called them into covenant with Himself based on His moral and spiritual demands. Jesus, in fact, said on the eve eve of His death for the sins of the world, and we'll think about this a little bit more next Sunday when we take what we call the Lord's Supper, this, as He holds the bread and the cup of the Passover meal, He said, this is the new covenant in My blood, Luke 22, uh, 20. The history of Israel told throughout the Hebrew Bible reminds us that our relationship with God is on His terms and not ours. The people of Israel prospered when they were seeking the Lord and following His ways. They did not prosper when they were not following His ways. We must now live in this grace and faith relationship that God has offered us through Jesus Christ that leads us to express the good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. But that's based on our response of faith, initiated by the grace of God and Jesus Christ. So, the question that we should ask personally this morning is not just, what about Israel and the land over there, but what about my heart and my relationship with God right here and right now? Have I put my trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Am I seeking to cooperate earnestly with the work of His Spirit to give shape to what that means in my life, in my relationships, in my work, and my purposes? Is there some area of our lives that we need to submit to His authority afresh right now? Because the ultimate land of God's promise is in the resurrection, the coming of the city of God, Hebrews 13, 14 makes this point. We will not see the final peace of Israel or the world until the great resurrection. But we must continue to pray and to work toward these ends. When even war is necessary to pursue justice, we must aim toward ultimate peace with righteousness. We look with hope toward a day when we live in the land where righteousness dwells. And that describes the whole world under the sovereignty of God. I hope that this will help us gain perspective, but also to pray. What is the answer to the hatred of the heart that would cause people to want to annihilate other people? It is only the grace of God in Jesus Christ that can conquer such entrenched hatred and such well, I guess you would say, well-taught hatred. Only God can undo that. Only God can overcome that. And only He 
has purposes that matter not just for time, not for place, but for all eternity and for everyone, everywhere, that He desires to come to know His grace in Jesus Christ. Let's pray together for a moment. Our Father, thank You for not leaving us without some guidance and direction on what's going on in Israel and Gaza, the West Bank, and other parts of the world even now, that there's a difference of viewpoint, of worldview at work, one that takes you into account and takes you into account as you have revealed yourself through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and ultimately through our Lord Jesus Christ that affirms the sacred nature of human life and ultimately leads to the fulfillment of that divine purpose for human life in the coming of your Son, our Lord Jesus, on whose basis we worship you every day and certainly when we come together every week. Thank you for giving us perspective. Thank you for loving us despite our own sometimes strong-willed and stubborn streaks that resist your purposes and good in our lives. We pray that they might be fulfilled in us and that your good purposes might be fulfilled for Israel, for Gazans, that you will bring people to repentance and new life through Jesus Christ our Lord that will make such conflicts a thing of the past. We look to you. We trust in you. We ask for your wisdom, your courage to do what we need to do in this world to express your righteousness and justice. And we thank you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I know this has been, it sounded like a lot about them over there, but ultimately the work of God comes back to me right here. And what is He doing in my heart and my life? And that's really what we focus on as we draw our time of worship to a close. How has God spoke, spoken to my heart? And what must my response be to Him and to His grace and His purposes for me and my world? Let's stand together as we sing. Brother Brett and I will be here at the front. If you need to come and pray, If there's something that you need to express in your response to God and His love and grace, you come and let's pray together. Beyond all.
Thank you. Please be seated for a minute. If you want a little preview of uh, what I'm going to be talking about next Sunday, uh, begin reading in Romans chapter 9. In fact, it might do you good to just read chapters 1 through 8 just to get a running start on it. And then by the time you get to 9, you'll know what he's talking about better. So uh, please note that too. Um, Vacation Bible School is right around the corner. Don't forget that. Uh, It's coming up before you know it couple weeks down the road, maybe three, July the 22nd through the 26th. We're doing it in the evening from 6 to 8.15. Ages three through having completed fifth grade are welcome to join. So you can register online at csbcfamily.com. You can scan the QR code here, or you can talk with somebody. There's probably a way to do this more, uh, you know, paper and pen and whatnot, but um, this is an easy way to do it. Get somebody who's got access to the Internet if you don't and get your kids signed up. Also, we're doing some uh, meals for the Drew, Drew's family. Jeannie and Sheila are coordinating that. There's a little sign-up list out on the table in the foyer. The, the, we need some volunteers to mow the lawn. Thanks for signing up for that. And some have asked about supporting Pastor Jeremy in his sabbatical time, extra expenses of travel. He's going to do some different trips to check out uh, campus ministries and grow in his ability to do that work here locally, so you can find information in the, nurse, in the uh, bulletin about that as well. There are new counter lists and nursery schedules out on the table in the foyer too, for those of you who serve in those ways, please note that. Uh, Piper is going to turn 17 on Friday. Happy birthday to you. Yay. <laughs> 17. I vaguely remember having been 17. Well, at least people tell me that I was 17. It's so long ago, I can't really remember what it was like, but, um, you know, it was, it was one of those years. It was one of those years, let me just say. Probably that's why I don't remember it. I'm trying to forget some of the things that happened that year. Um, let's uh, continue to pray for one another. My goodness, uh, it just never, uh, never do we come together without somebody coming together with a heavy heart, or, or some big challenge that they're facing. I remind you to keep uh, the Powell family in your prayers and love, and also to uh, reach out to David and Lori as you're able. And then don't forget the uh, Woody family, uh, the passing of uh, the Woody's nephew, cousin, kind of almost like a, a child and brother in the family, so close. So that's that's a hard goodbye as well. So remember these things and keep them in your prayers. Somehow I completely missed the fact that Marilyn Myrna had been married 60 years last November. So, I mean, the upside of having been married 60 years last November is, man, you're still married all these months since then. So that's, that's just extra great. And I'm always the last one to know. But anyway, bless you guys and keep it up. And thank God that He he loves us, whether we're short, tall, or anywhere in between, uh, with the love He has shown us in Jesus Christ. Thank you, uh, Stephen and company, for filling in for Jeremy. And let's all stand and go with a song, shall we? Sounds good.
Amen. And praise God that we have that hope. See you next time. Thanks.